And I think that right now the challenge in confronting the climate crisis is symptomatic of some of the larger challenges we have right now in our uh, public discourse. Hi, this is Dr. Jed McCosco at Wake Forest University and AcademicInfluence.com. And today I'm really excited because on our show we have Professor Michael Mann from uh, Penn State University in Pennsylvania. And uh, he's gonna tell us a little bit about the growing controversy surrounding climate change and some of his roles in it. So first of all, Professor Mann, when did you get started? When did you move from theoretical physics and start working on climate change? Yeah, thanks, Jed. It's good to be with you. Um, so, uh, you know, back in uh, 1989, I graduated from UC Berkeley with a double major in applied math and physics and decided to go off to Yale University to study theoretical physics. And after a couple of years into the program, 1992, I believe I, I was uh, what we call all but dissertation. I had passed my exams. I was ready to start my research. And I had sort of a crisis of scientific identity, which is to say that I just wasn't excited enough about the sorts of problems that I was being given to, to solve um, in the physics field at that time. And so I literally, um, in response to this crisis, the, you know, this uh, crisis of scientific identity, um, opened up the uh, catalog of uh, science and applied science at Yale University and started sort of flipping through the pages and seeing what else was going on. Um, and after one or two dead ends, um, I ended up talking to a professor in the Department of Geology and Geophysics who was using math and physics to study Earth's climate system. And this sounded like a fascinating big picture science problem that I could get excited about and where I could uh, you know, use the tools um, that I had learned in math and physics to work at the forefront of uh, research in this area. It was an exciting time to be getting uh, into uh, the field of climate studies. And so I didn't look back. I ended up um, uh, deciding to work uh, with him, uh, Barry Saltzman, a uh, professor in the Department of Geology and Geophysics at Yale University, uh, doing my PhD in that department, uh, studying uh, Earth's climate, um, analyzing climate data, and constructing uh, theoretical models of Earth's climate system. Wow, amazing. And when you finished up your PhD at Yale, did you go immediately into studying the Earth's climate? And in what capacity were you doing that? Yeah, so it's sort of funny. I ended up um, starting a postdoctoral fellowship uh, before I had uh, um, before I had uh, been awarded my PhD. Uh, I had defended my PhD, but we did that sort of on a, an accelerated time frame so I could start this uh, Department of Energy postdoctoral fellowship that I had uh, been awarded um, to work with uh, some scientists at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, Massachusetts, where I actually grew up. Um, and uh, so ended up starting that postdoctoral uh, fellowship after I had def successfully defended my PhD, but I didn't yet have the piece of paper that came in 1998. And so I did my postdoc uh, at, at UMass working with uh, Ray Bradley, who's a climate expert uh, there in their department of geosciences and um, ended up uh, staying on as a research professor until 1999, where I took a position, an academic position at the University of Virginia in their department of environmental sciences. And was it while you were at Virginia that uh, everything sort of blew up with a uh, hockey stick and you on the internet? Or when did that all happen? <laughs> so I would say um, in 1998, uh, a couple of years into my postdoctoral research, my co-authors and I published uh, the now iconic uh, hockey stick curve in an article in the journal Nature back in April 1998. In fact, it was on Earth Day 1998, April 22nd. And it got a fair amount of uh, media attention. Um, and uh, it sort of quickly became sort of this icon in the climate change debate because um, you know the, the graph that we published told a pretty simple story. You didn't have to understand the complex workings of Earth's climate system, the physics and the math to understand what this graph was telling us, that there was this unprecedented warming taking place today. And by implication, um, it, probably has to do with us. It coincides with the industrial revolution and the dramatic increase in carbon dioxide concentrations from fossil fuel burning and other human activities. And so it became, uh, you know, the, the, the hockey stick, you know, describes the, the shape of the curve, um, the handle, if you will, is the sort of moderate cooling 
beginning a thousand years ago into the depths of the Little Ice Age. And the blade is the sharp upturn, the warming of the past century, which has no precedent as far back as we were able to go a thousand years and again. So it told a pretty simple story. And because it told a simple story, it was a threat to some of the powerful vested interests who find the science of climate change inconvenient because it implies that we need to do something uh, about the problem. We need to move away from our dependence on fossil fuels. Uh, and that's a threat, uh, obviously, to some powerful vested interests. Mm -hmm. It sure is. Now, had you published that paper 10 years earlier, do you think it would have been something that uh, our country would have acted on? I, I hear that Back around those days, there was sort of a bipartisan um, group that was trying to do something about carbon emissions, uh, both Republicans and Democrats. So do you think it would have been a little bit better if it had been discovered earlier? That's a great question. Um, and, you know, the, the hockey stick wasn't necessarily the critical development in our understanding of human-caused climate change. It, it was visually very compelling, and it got a lot of uh, sort of, um, you know, attention and uh and it's often been pointed to as sort of a, 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 a central exhibit uh, in the case for human-caused climate change. But by that time, by the mid-1990s, in fact, there was already an emerging scientific consensus that the planet was warming up and it was human activity that was responsible for that. And so it is interesting that it was sort of um, in that period, in the mid to, to late 1990s, where the attacks on climate science really started to ramp up. Um, as you allude to, there was actually uh, some degree of bipartisan support uh, for environmental uh, policy in general uh, prior to that period. Uh, Richard Nixon gave us the EPA. Uh, Ronald Reagan signed the Montreal Protocol to, uh, to, to ban uh, ozone depleting uh, chlorofluorocarbons. Uh, George H.W. Uh, Bush gave us cap and trade. Uh, to deal with the acid rain problem. And so there had been in the 80s and even into the early 90s, um, sort of some bipartisan support, I would say, for market mechanisms um, for dealing with environmental problems. And that eroded as the implications of the science uh, became clear. Um, and what became especially clear was that uh, the findings of climate science posed a major challenge to the world's largest and most po powerful industry, the fossil fuel industry. And they chose to use their excessive influence and power and wealth to uh, under, you know, to, to engage in a decades long campaign um, mm -hmm. to discredit the science. And it's yeah. unfortunate because it yeah. wasn't always partisan. It wasn't always partisan, but it sounds like had your stuff come out and, and everybody's stuff come out 10 years earlier, it would have just sped up uh, the resistance by 10 years. So it wouldn't, <laughs> well, that's, wouldn't be more. <laughs> I, I think there's some some truth to that. Um, okay. the, the opposition really was a response to how clear the science had become. Uh, for some time, Fossil fuel interests were perfectly happy to entertain the idea that we needed to throw more money at the research, uh, that this was a problem with lots of uncertainty. Let's continue to study it. Uh, and by the way, we're happy to, to support funding of climate science as long as the science sort of um, you know, remained inconclusive. And once the science became conclusive, well, then it was a much greater threat. So I think mm -hmm. you're exactly right. That was the critical development. That was the critical. And, and it wasn't like with uh, acid rain, where they could change the way they burned coal or switch from coal to natural gas. This was every single thing that they stood for, you know, taking carbon out of the ground and putting it into the rest of the world. There was no way around it at that point. So in some ways, there was nothing they could do about it that would, would change the way they could make money essentially. Um, yeah, it's, it's a really good point. I mean, it's interesting when you look at, uh, again, sort of past uh, uh, global environmental crises and, and how we responded to them and sort of the politics of uh, how, how, how that came together. Um, you know, the, there's this myth that, for example, that the, the chemical industry was, you know, uh, a happy player um, in the efforts to combat ozone uh, depletion. But in fact, when you talk to scientists who were sort of um, fighting that battle uh, back in the, you know, the 1970s, 1980s, um, there was quite a bit of opposition from industry um, because it did 
impact their uh, bottom line. There were alternatives to these ozone depleting chlorofluorocarbons. Um, so that's critical. There were alternatives that could be used, um, but they were more expensive. Mm -hmm. And so there was quite a bit of give and take, uh, but ultimately I think there was a lot more good faith back then. Mm -hmm. And industry in the end did work hand in hand with politicians and scientists, and we solved this problem collectively. And that was sort of the history mm -hmm. of these global environmental problems. Um, I think we've entered into, you know, a regime, you know, we talked about how uh, the, as the science became more de definitive and it really represented a challenge to uh, the most powerful and, and wealthy industry, the, the fossil fuel industry, but com we have to combine that with sort of the hyper-partisan atmosphere, no pun mm -hmm. intended, that we now find ourselves in, which makes it so much uh, more difficult for industry and government um, mm -hmm. and, and, and policymakers to work together. And I think that right now, the challenge in confronting the climate crisis is symptomatic of some of the larger challenges we have right now in our uh, public discourse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's a combination of it being right to the jugular of the fossil fuel industry. They had no other way to get around it. It was just their whole life is bringing fossil fuel, you know, carbon up from the ground. And then the climate of uh, discourse had changed. And we, we interview a lot of political scientists on this program. One of them at Harvard, Steve Walt, said that it was because of Newt Gingrich that weaponized the, the left right. and the right. right. And everybody, both on the left and the right, just after that kind of fell, followed suit and started having discourse that was not as productive. And yeah. then climate science just kind of got caught in that back and forth uh, volley between the two sides. And we I couldn't that's make right. the same kind of progress that we did when the EPA was signed by Nixon, as you mentioned. And things just seemed to work a lot better. You know, we cleaned up our air, we cleaned up acid rain, we changed emission standards on vehicles, uh, all, you know, with, without too much trouble. Uh, but this is now a different era. Yes, um, that's right. I, I was going to have one more interesting data point to yeah, that, which was on climate specifically, we really saw a remarkable transition in the early years of the George W. Bush administration. And in, in my book, the, the Hockey Stick and the Climate Wars, I begin one of the chapters with a quote. And I tell you, it's um, one of the two candidates in the 2000 election on the campaign trail. And he's talking about the importance of acting on climate. And we're going to regulate carbon emissions. And you would be certain that it was Al Gore, but it wasn't. It was George W. Bush. <laughs> and it was really during his first term where there was a somewhat of a coup um, by Dick Cheney, the vice president, who was very closely tied to the energy industry, to mm. Enron. And they sort of came in. They kicked out uh, Christine Todd Whitman, a Republican, former uh, governor of New Jersey, um, mm. a Republican who was very um, proactive on climate. And, and, mm -hmm. and, and under her uh, leadership in the EPA, carbon was declared a pollutant to be regulated under the Clean Air Act. Uh, well, you know, the forces of uh, delay and denial and inaction swooped in. She was out of there. <laughs> Um, within a year, and uh, the rest is history. Mm, and then okay. Dick Cheney and the energy industry took over, um, mm -hmm. and they were now uh, in control of uh, energy and environmental policy. Uh, George W. Bush himself was actually on the right side, as was his father. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's good. Good to remember. Um, now, the first time I came across your name was uh, when uh, the media was a buzz with "Hide the Decline." So how do you explain that whole uproar uh, to people who have just heard about it in passing? Yeah, so, you know, it's it's more than 10 years old now, the so-called climate gate uh, affair. And I think you know, there have been so many um, additional attempts to play that game, climate change critics to take words and phrases uh, out of context to misrepresent the uh, scientists. And we've seen that now writ large in our politics, right? You know, where else have we heard, uh, you know, uh, this story? Um, stolen emails uh, used to, you know, impact our politics in a way that's adversarial, um, you know, that that is adverse to uh, a prominent politician, be it the Russiagate and, and Hillary Clinton, or the politics of climate change and mm -hmm. climate scientists and some of the same players, in fact, in uh, Russiagate, uh, uh, the, uh, Russia, obviously, um, WikiLeaks, uh, Julian Assange, um, some of the same players 
uh, that were involved in that effort to sort of impact the last presidential election were also involved in this earlier episode, which sometimes has been described as almost a test run for what we saw happen in our last election. Um, and it was indeed a, a bad faith effort to, to take stolen emails and mine from them individual words and phrases like hide the decline you mentioned. That was actually a reference um, by one of my colleagues to a well-known problem that they had published on in the journal Nature um, about the decline of certain types of tree ring uh, measurements to temperature, the response to temperature declines after the 1960s, and there were various theories uh, for why that happens. It's known as the divergence problem, and it may have to do with other uh, impacts on tree growth like ultraviolet radiation or acid rain. Um, it's an area still of active inquiry, but it was a, a completely harmless discussion about how to deal with um, these misleading data um, in a graph that uh, this colleague was preparing. And basically he was saying, I'm not gonna show the bad data because that would be misleading. So we're eliminating you know, the, 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 these particular tree ring records um, after the 1960s where we know they no longer represent temperatures very well in this mm -hmm. graph that he was preparing for a World Meteorological uh, uh, Organization um, cover of a, a WMO report. Um, so, you know, there were many examples of mm -hmm. that where something that was quite harmless, which was just, you know, uh, jargon between scientists like a trick, you know, a trick is a clever way of solving a problem yeah. to a mathematician or a scientist, but you can turn around and use that to make it sound like scientists are engaged in nefarious efforts to <laughs> trick the public. Um, you know, many investigations uh, later, you know, what we now know is there really was only one um, act of misconduct, and it was the, the theft of those emails in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, it's sort of, you know, the fool me once, um, you know, that sort of that that approach to undermining faith in, 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 in science, I think, um, is no longer useful because it, it was discredited. You know, they had their moment. Um, organizations took you know, years to, you know, to fully assess um, all of these emails and the claims and counterclaims and to come to the conclusion that there was no wrongdoing. And in the meantime, the critics were able to do damage to climate policy. They were able to yep. sabotage, for example, the Copenhagen summit of December 2009. And the stolen emails appeared just within a month of that summit. Clearly, it was designed to hijack and sabotage that, that important climate summit. And as mm -hmm. you alluded to, that set us back, right? There are all of these things that have set us back. If we had acted decades ago, um, we would be going down a bunny slope. Uh, when it comes to uh, the reduction in carbon emissions that we need to avoid catastrophic warming. Now, instead, we've got a black double diamond slope if you're a mm. skier. We've got a yes. much uh, tougher, um, you know, uh, tougher path to follow. We have to reduce our carbon emissions much more dramatically. Um, ironically, because of efforts to delay action, to discredit the science, it set us back and it's made it more costly now to act. But what will be much more costly will be if we fail to act. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, thank you so much for spending some time with us today to share your thoughts. It's been truly interesting and I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, it was my pleasure. It was great talking with you. <laughs>